Hi guys and welcome to Dissemination Day episode 5 where we are going to be starting Paddy's long-awaited practice leadership series. Um, thank you all for following us this far and we hope you enjoy it. So because Paddy let the game go um, a couple of weeks ago you've known that this was our topic for a while um, but let's start with asking um, why did you pick practice leadership? Why did I pick practice leadership? A um, number of reasons really Tay. I think um, the, you know the, the paper that came out last year, the Hasiotis paper about randomised control trial with mm -hmm. um, PBS? I'm familiar, yeah. Yeah. Um, and what that paper demonstrated was that just PBS training on its own made very little difference. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of other stuff around it, but essentially that was it. Now, really, I think one of the, the mechanisms that kind of can bring training to life uh, in services is practice leadership one of the applications. So again, I think for one of the reasons I was really keen that we discussed this um, topic is I think there are a lot of practitioners out there that are struggling to perhaps get uh, elements of their behaviour support plans implemented or people aren't sure why they, um, how to approach cultural change within services sure. um, and also about really um, uh, supporting those kind of positive practices within services. So yeah. So, so is there like an agreed definition of what practice leadership is? Is there, you know, obviously for PBS there's the, the Gore definition, the Kincaid definition and McDonald's components, but is there one agreed one for practice leadership? No. Okay. No, there's a lot of different definitions, but uh, you know, that, that's, that's fine. The definition from the, so the paper that we're going to have a look at today. Good point is uh, practice leadership at the front line in supporting people with intellectual disabilities and challenging behaviour, a qualitative study of registered managers of community-based staff and group homes. And that's in the Journal of Applied Research and Intellectual Disabilities, 2016, we'll put the notes up, and it's from Roy DeVoe and Peter McGill. Yeah. It is that. And you were asking me before about this, because specifically because it's qualitative, it wouldn't normally fall into the remit of some of the ABA research that we look at. Yeah. But we decided not to kick it out just because it's not no, a single case. And we, sh we shouldn't. We shouldn't. No, absolutely. Um, and we know Roy well, as they say. We know Roy well, we know Peter well, yeah. yeah. Um, and I know nothing about this paper. So you're, you're in luck. I'm going to tell you. Come to the right place. So uh, in this paper, they actually use a definition from a different paper. Okay. So um, uh, probably the most research into practice leadership, particularly in the UK, has been with regards to active support. Mm -hmm. uh, Julie Beadle Brown, Jim Mansell, John Ockenden, uh, and a few other people. Which, in fact, we'll talk about that paper next time. All right. But um, they uh, define practice leadership as in the context of implementing active support. Practice leadership is defined as the development and maintenance of good staff support for service users through managers. Spending time observing staff work, providing feedback and modelling good practice, providing staff with regular one-to-one -one supervision and team meetings focused on improving service user engagement and staff user relationships. So it doesn't specifically mean the person responsible for the PBS plan? No, no. And interestingly, I mean, one of the things that you'll find uh, as an emerging theme in the literature, you know... <laughs> If you look at the early, some of Jim Mansell's early work, particularly around uh, the Mansell reports, and um, uh, Jim had a line that's been used many times by some of our colleagues over the years, that uh, don't take your most valuable resource and hide it away in an office, or was words to that effect. You know, so um, some time ago, I think it was really, uh, the onus was on that service manager to be the leader of practice within the service, but as we know, um, the landscape has changed somewhat, you know, the uh, administrative requirements on managers, um, managers that are now required to manage across homes, across regions, etc, etc. The role of the managers changed very much. I think it's one of the interesting uh, things to take away from these papers is that I think that the focus on the manager being the practice leader um, isn't so much of a possibility anymore, actually, with the requirements. So really, it's about taking some of this knowledge and figuring out how we can use it in services. Because again, what this paper goes on to, 
to well, in fact, let's just briefly introduce it. So it was um, uh, interpretive phenomenological analysis. From now on, known as IPA. IPA, right, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Um, so again, interviewing managers, mm -hmm. basically, really. And then what they do is they take all of the of the data from those interviews and they spend a lot of time going into those the specific words used, the phrases used, the language used, yes. and pulling out common themes, themes across different different respondents. Perfect. Yeah. So within this, so Roy and Peter had interviewed care home managers across the southeast of England, I believe, in particular. Um, so 19 your area my area and in fact I think I was actually working for an organization at the time and Roy came in and interviewed the managers if okay. I remember okay um, so but he didn't interview time. you so there's no conflict they didn't interview me no I wasn't manager of the service at that time no mm -hmm. um, so 19 managers and there were five themes that emerged mm -hmm. and they were one uh, so again interview the managers and saying what's important about practice leadership what influences it here in your service mm -hmm. Um, Do you know how they picked the services? Like, did they pick services that had amazing CQC reports, or was it...? No. I don't know, actually. I'm not sure exactly how. Okay. Um, my guess would be those services that Roy knew, because yeah. he... Roy's probably going to be southeast. shouting at this video, being like, Tia, I did it like this. Yeah, <laughs> Obviously, we should have asked him. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll be getting a telling off if <laughs> yeah. this isn't accurate yeah, when Roy sees it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, so those five themes... Um, and the way that, that, that Roy described, Roy and Peter describe it in the article is that uh, themes that contribute to a conceptual framework for thinking about frontline management and practice leadership. Okay. And those themes were managers knowing what's going on. Mm -hmm. you know, how, are you, how do you know what's going on and how are you monitoring what's happening in service? And we'll talk about this in a little bit, but um, they talk a lot about the difference between management and leadership, and I'll come to that in a while. Yeah, and that's a big thing, isn't it? Big thing. Yeah. And also formal versus informal systems. Okay. Um, the second theme was developing new practice and new ways of working with service users. And again, that's really going back to the, the definition around active support that they use is managers that are spending time observing staff and watching practice emerge. So one of the things that Roy talks about a lot in these papers, uh, and Roy's work on practice leadership, talks about tacit knowledge. Mm -hmm. So knowledge that isn't written down anyway, it's not part of a plan. Mm -hmm. It's when you observe two people together and they're not following any scripts, they just have a good way of working with each other. So that's this concept of tacit knowledge. And I think one of Roy's points very often is, uh, sometimes it's difficult to articulate the specifics around that. Um, and interestingly, I think it, the, the roles of people like you and I, who are going in as consultants to services, as well as doing our functional behaviour assessments and so on and so forth, we need to spend time just observing staff because sometimes you see those little golden nuggets and it's not written down anywhere. Mm -hmm. Someone else might not even be aware of it. It's just mm -hmm. what that particular staff member does uh, with that individual. So again, I think it's a really important point about... Um, one, knowing what's going on, how do you do it? And two, how do we develop new practices? Because actually sometimes you see stuff from, from staff, yeah. like those direct care staff that isn't written down anywhere else in the service. Mm -hmm. The third um, group was uh, managers approach to developing and shaping staff performance. Okay, so how they, um, is that about how they change the staff practice on an individual level? Yes. Yeah. So in fact, sorry, slight. Uh, the way that they've described this is there's five groups, and then there's um, themes within those groups. So okay. I'll give you an example. So on that, managers' approach to developing and shaping staff performance would be um, the two themes underneath that: the importance of personal observation and contact to inform shaping performance, yep. and long-term patient development of staff, but happy to let them go if in performance didn't improve. So. Yeah, so making sure that I've actually I've given you the tools that you need and all the advice that you need to be able to do the job properly, but then being able to make that decision that actually I've done everything I can and it's still not right, so now I need to be yeah. willing to um, to to do the right thing and, and absolutely, yeah. get rid of yeah. that staff member from that. Yeah, team. absolutely. Yeah. Um, Which would be so hard for me. Well, maybe you... you would it, if you saw bad practice going on repeatedly, and somebody, you know, after the work that you put in, is trying to address that, that they would continue to persist 
in practice that we know was resulting in someone having a physical restraint, perhaps. I think it probably is. It probably would be really hard for me. I think it would be really hard for some people who are like me and struggle with confrontation, but actually um, it is the right thing to do. But just... It also raises a really interesting point about um, training. So again, I'm not quite on this paper at the minute, but um, uh, we've been doing some work with regards to um, policy development and using the uh, organisational behaviour management mm -hmm. approaches. And actually, it's really interesting that sometimes you need to train staff in how to give feedback, but we're also talking about training staff in how to receive feedback too. Yeah. It's really interesting, I think. Anyway, I sidetracked you. So yeah. you were on number three, which was about developing and shaping staff performance. Yeah. performance. Yeah. Number four was about the influence of employing and external organisations. So that really has an impact. So again, the some of the stuff that we were talking about earlier. So you know the regulatory requirements from CQC perhaps, or the administrative requirements that an organisation places on its manager. They're all things that can directly impact that manager's ability to get out and spend time with staff teams, observe practice, and etc. Yeah, we've so had a number of council meetings because CQC are in. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. For sure. Um, so again, let me just check that. So yeah, positive and negative to talk about, and uh, you know, positive and negative aspects. So. You know, some uh, some organisations are really clear that their managers need to go and spend X amount of time with their staff teams and that kind of stuff. So it can, it can work both ways. It can uh, be very supportive of practice, elements of practice leadership, but it can also stifle it yeah. as well. Um, and the fifth group um, was the manager's personal feelings and values. That's interesting. Very interesting. So again, things like... Uh, Managers promoting their value base within the team. Mm -hmm. um, the prime importance of development of self, staff, service users. Um, and I think those kind of expectations that people have, you know, what is possible. Mm. So this is making me think about, um, about Royalton Hall, um, surprising, because I watched it and um, I made my mother-in-law watch it the night that it was out. And one of the comments that she made to me was, God, that must that service must have a really appalling manager. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and she said a couple of times, you know, where's the manager? Um, and I was thinking about that because, you know, if we took one of the managers, in any manager in the world that we would think really highly of, you know, and there are several of them that we think are fantastic, but if we were to just pick one and put them in charge of Walton Hall, would that be all that, would that have made it, would that have prevented it? <laughs> well, <clears throat> to bring it back to the paper, is um, they one of the things that they discuss is this conceptual kind of framework of, the, of management and leadership, mm -hmm. and I'll just give a, a, one of the definitions that they use from it. Yeah. Is management denotes the implementation and monitoring of routine procedures and processes, whilst leadership primarily concerns the exercise of social influence within a work setting to develop goals and the means of achieving this. Now, <clears throat> just to jump around a little bit. Um, particularly in this paper, uh, participants felt that those informal uh, interactional aspects of monitoring led to a more accurate impression of how staff were really acting. And they go on and talk about, uh, they reference another paper, which forgive me, I can't think off the top of my head, but they talk about um, the shadow system within services and I think it was really interesting. So those formalised management processes and the, the formalised kind of narratives that are out there in brochures and websites and all that kind of stuff. And actually what they're talking about with this shadow system is what's really happening? Who are the influencers of that, that um, uh, this kind of social practice there? Um, and very much a focus on uh, you know who's driving that shadow system. So again, just putting a good manager into a place like that doesn't mean you get yeah. guarantee you're going to do uh, make those changes. Uh, and you might need to do some of what we were speaking about previously about you know it might be a time for people to move on mm -hmm. with all of that. But I think there's a definitely a better chance when you have a manager in place with those kind of values. But yeah, again, it's very much about um, this paper talks very much about the. the the balance between formal organisational systems and informal interactional systems. Yeah. So again, I think when they really talk about management being concerned with the setting of meetings, supervisions, the training structures, you know, what paperwork you're using, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. But having all of that in place yeah. does not mean that you're going to support 
the right behaviours in that setting. Mm -hmm. You know, what what you and I talk about all the time is their passive strategies. Yes. You know, their passive strategies. And you need them. They need to be there. Absolutely, I think so too. So yeah, so, but then function, how do we get people engaged with those right behaviours? Mm-hmm. And again, we'll talk later, we're, in this little mini-series we're going to do on practice leadership, <clears throat> we, can, we can bring some papers in that demonstrate some of the, um, some of the approaches to affecting change. So just, just presence and feedback on their own have a massive influence, but again, we'll talk about some, some papers further down the line in that. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, this is one of the things that this paper really... Um, drives that actually is um, that the learning on the job, the managers of these services felt that had much more influence on the staff practice than the classroom based training they were attending. Which makes huge sense. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, it also I seem to reference it's leading to some more creative ways of working when they're actually spending time observing staff working with people that they were picking up stuff that they that they'd never seen before. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so I think that uh, essentially where it goes really, or, or part of my interpretation of this model is, um, or this paper is that you need to think about both aspects. You know, how are we setting up the formal structures of the service to actually support? those informal interactional structures within the services. Mm-hmm. And I think my interpretation of this is it's difficult to do one without the other. Mm-hmm. You know, we need to have a framework. If you've got an amazing member of staff that's a great practice leader on certain aspects of supporting people, what process have we got in place to make sure that gets distributed across the staff team? Because what you can end up with is pockets of people yeah. that are really great practitioners that have really great... Um, is this where your red bean analogy comes in? That's one of our being analogy. Dilute and juice. You know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we've, um, I'm just trying to think what else we've got on here. Um, yeah, no, essentially, I think, to, to kind of tie it up to about that 18 minutes, I think that's that's really one of the things to, to get across is be clear about that. So we, the informal stuff clearly influences culture much more so than the formal stuff yeah. is what these papers are indicating. And I don't think that's something to be uh, scared about. And some people, I think some people's gut is we need to get rid of those informal systems. That's oh, not structured and routine. Yeah. And, and don't get rid of the informal systems. And, yeah. Use it. Because just like you were saying, the water and hall stuff, it was the informal culture that really, really was dictating practice there. Mm-hmm. And actually we can, we can hate that. Or we can look back at all of those, Winterbourne, you know, you mm-hmm. name it, the, all of those, and and look back at that and go, that informal culture was winning. Yeah. It was winning. So I think there's, there's almost a reverse engineering job to be done, going, how can we use that informal culture for good? Yeah. And for me, I think that's where we need to look at both sides of this, the formalised structures around meetings, supervisions, how do we learn from the informal stuff? Mm-hmm. And again, how do we distribute that across staff teams? So... For my final question, I guess I'm thinking is if I am a service manager or a deputy service manager or just a team leader or just a really awesome person working in support services, what can I take away from today? What can I take from this paper to take back into my service? How do I turn myself into a really good practice leader? Hmm. That's a good question. I'm going to have a quick look at my notes. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's the best way to describe? I think there's something about, you know, if we go back to that definition, mm-hmm. so uh, practice leadership de- de- defines the development and maintenance of good staff support for service users through X. Mm-hmm. So I think that's that's one of the first questions. What is it that you're looking to improve mm-hmm. within your service? And then I think it's about looking at kind of formal and informal systems. How can I develop... Um, by formal and informal systems to help with that. And again, some of this stuff isn't really complicated. Spend time with staff teams, you know. Go and spend time, try and figure out as well as what's going well for people and what needs to be distributed more more widely across teams. Are there any areas of practice that could be improved? Mm -hmm. And I would say start small. So you want to take a a, a core of people, two Mm -hmm. or three people that have got a great relationship with the individual that you're supporting, perhaps, Mm -hmm. and get them to master whatever it is. So maybe it's supporting somebody swimming, maybe it's a new morning routine for somebody, maybe it's, you know, you, you name it. 
And if we can get a, 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 those two people or three people really skilled in that particular approach, and we iron out any of the difficulties in that particular approach with those two or three people, then we can start looking at how we extend that more widely across the team. I think the challenge is very often is, you know, there'll be one training day for a staff team of 25 on a mm-hmm. particular thing. And in the reality, that's really hard to manage. So I think we need to have that procedural fidelity, mm-hmm. you would say, you know, or just making sure people are doing what it is that they're supposed to be doing. I know it creases out of that and then look to see how you can extend it. Love that. Good. Thanks, mate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Hope you enjoyed it, guys. See you later. See ya.